Hey everybody, welcome to the Tech Bro Show. We took an unannounced hiatus last week. We think I think we both had a lot going on. So we are back in full force. How you doing, Lauren? I am excellent. It is uh been a long, long week. Um I don't know. What are the headlines this week? I mean, in the data world, which we're gonna get into today with our guests, like in the last week, uh, you know, I always love watching Snowflake. I think where Snowflake moves. Uh, as a stock and as a, a business and, a, and as a hub um, type of business around which a lot of satellites move, uh, you know, they have announced uh, that they're changing their guidance forward. It's going to have more headwinds going forward. You know, you can look at their earnings report and see, uh, you know, what their opinion is about the world and how they're uh, approaching things moving forward. But yeah, a lot of uh, optimizations, a lot of spends, uh, changes that aren't necessarily in favor of Snowflake. We're seeing this throughout the cloud, right? Uh, Datadog um, as well. Uh, You know, you can go and look and and we've discussed it more in depth on the show uh, in the past. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, excited today because we're talking about uh, some different you know, what I like about both of the people that we are speaking to today is one, they're both CTOs and architects, technologists, mm-hmm. um, which I always love more than marketing fluff people. Uh, I can be a marketing fluff person. You can be a marketing fluff person. Mar- Mary. Marketing is never fluff. Come on. Marketing is <laughs> never fluff, right? But yeah, I'm excited because... Uh, uh, well, you just, you just dove yeah, right in. Usually we do some light sort of off topic banter, but you dove right into, you know, data. No, I like it because, uh, you know, like, yeah. like as, as all these companies out here are not making money, uh, you know, a lot of these companies with huge, huge marketing engines, they're doing more marketing and, and less product, uh, right? Like what dial are they turning? Uh, and we're talking to, you know, uh, two people today who are less flashy. Uh, with their uh, businesses. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to get in the weeds on a lot of things that are anti-patterns, things that might be wrong. Uh, Any viewers, obviously, come in and ask questions, uh, technical questions, put people uh, on the spot. And yeah, uh, yeah, I'm excited. We can do do the usual where anyone who wants to come on in the the second half of the show directly on screen and ask questions, we can share the link um, town hall style. Lauren, for like two minutes before we bring our guests on and, and, and introduce them and get into the, the discussion, can you give, because again, we have we have a lot of people who watch the show who are deep in data, data infrastructure, both the economy and the, the technical side of all that. Um, but like the, the, the quick overview for people who maybe don't know some of say, you know, for example, what Debezium is or change data capture, like tell them what we're talking about um, before we get into it. Yeah, what we're talking about here is basically, uh, you know, change data capture, which uh, some people think is controversial. Uh, The people who have strong opinions on it are often those who are very, uh, you know, in the weeds, but change data capture, uh, real time, near real time, these terms get thrown around a lot. Basically, you're replicating uh, data from, you know, one system, like often Postgres would be a good example. And you want that data somewhere else in a different system. And there's a bunch of different ways. Uh, like the explain like I'm five version is, you know, you can scan that data in a number of different ways. Um, you can, you know, turn certain levers on how fast it is. Um, a lot of the last couple of years have been focused on uh, batch um, and batch that is not very fast, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, a lot of, you know, folks out there like Fivetran and a couple other vendors, uh, you know, on the back side, they might actually be doing CDC, uh, but then you still don't get your data for five minutes or 15 minutes or an hour anyways. Uh, and there's been, you know, uh, a lot of uh, pushback to these types of things. So with, with CDC, and, and Debezium as a piece of this has uh, been, um, you know, uh, widely distributed uh, in the last couple of years, you know, open source, uh, you know, you can go and use Debezium, uh, run it in-house with your engineers, set up, uh, you know, change data capture yourself. Um, you know, we can get into the landscape a little bit of how this plays into 
streaming solutions and whatnot. But uh, yeah, um, when there's something that's in the market for a few years and it's been distributed, uh, you know, it often has a target on its back. Other people have a better version of doing things. Uh, and yeah, we're going to get into some of that today. So. Awesome. Well, let's, let's bring on our guests. So we've got, we'll let, let them introduce themselves so we don't massacre any names. So welcome both. Raj, hey. why don't you go first and introduce yourself? Hi. Hey, thanks, um, Tech Bros, for inviting me. Uh, this is Raj Sen, founder and CTO at Archeon. Uh, prior to starting the company, I worked mainly in the database world. I was a kernel engineer at Sybase. It's kind of a you know, previous generation of LTP database company. Uh, we were acquired by SAP. I worked on um, a product called SAP HANA, which is in the in-memory side. Then I worked for Oracle for five years. And then I was in an in-memory database startup called MemSQL, which has now become single store. Um, and yeah, very excited to do this today with Johnny and you know both of you. Yeah. Welcome. Um, I, I, hey, I'm, I'm Johnny. I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO of uh, Estuary. Um, so my trajectory is more, I'm like recovering from ads in many respects. Like I spent a lot of time doing working in the ad tech industry, which uh, whatever you may feel about it from a you know, advertising standpoint, like as an engineer, there are some really interesting like problems within within that space. So I kind of like cut a lot of teeth just figuring out how to move a lot of data very quickly for different business cases that we had uh, and kind of backed into this through some, you know, tech and techniques that we ended up building for a previous company uh, that we've kind of taken and are now building on and trying to make a lot easier for uh, for the industry today and what we're doing. So. Excellent. Yeah, and then it's, let's just get right into it. Uh, like, what is what is wrong with how uh, companies are approaching uh, change data capture or ETL, ELT, batch processing, whatever? Like, what wh what are a lot of companies getting wrong today? Uh, and I'll start with uh, you, Raj. Uh, you know, would love to hear your opinions on it. Yeah. So I think. <sighs> There's nothing wrong. Like everything is relative with you know what stage you are and how you know how much money you have. Honestly, like that's how you know I I come I I compare all of this with buying a house, right? You can have five million dollars and you can buy in back heights in San Francisco, or you could ha not have that money and you could look for a suburban home. So you know you got to make the right choice. Um, and often I am seeing that um, you know there is a lot of um, misinformation. There's a lot of you know buzzwords that's going on in the industry, um, and uh, people are falling into a lot of hype stuff, right? So, and for me, coming from the, an enterprise background where we have been taught that you know um, we should always use the product that makes the most sense, economy-wise and everything. Uh, so, I think, uh, and overall, I think there is an open source angle to it, and there is like a efficiency angle to it. So, on DBZM particularly. I think it's um, it's a good thing in the CDC space, but it's a means to an end, as you as you mentioned, Lauren. Like you know, uh, so the DBZM has a few connectors, but they are just the extraction part of the CDC. So what the CDC gives us, like like CDC is a way to you know, ideally you should not put pressure on the source database and get stuff out of it. Now, well, we can go into the ELT, ET, ELT, ETL you know, debate in a few moments and I have opinions on that. My sense coming from a world of Sybase, Oracle is DBAs do not like bombarding the database for getting changes. You are mm -hmm. indicated by DBAs if you throw in queries to the database to read whatever, right? So if you use a timestamp column or, you know, if imagine you have an ERP system running on SAP and Oracle, and you go to the DB and said, hey, you know what? I'm going to fire like queries per table or, you know, um, imagine you have 1,000 tables to do CDC. You're going to throw up like, what, 30 connections and all of that stuff. No DB is going to allow it. Um, so, A, uh, there is a bit of a difference between change data capture and redo log stuff, which I think that DBZM... I think they have some good connectors. Like I think their MySQL connector is pretty good. A lot of companies have adopted it, but it's a means to an end. And the end goal could be 
something like streaming transformation that I think, you know, uh, Estuary is doing very well, or like kind of if you want to do joins and stuff on the CDC stream, or the means to an end could be an end to end uh, database replication thing that we do, right? Uh, we don't use DBZM. So one challenge I am seeing with all our users that have used DBZM and, uh, you know, moved to an Archeon thing is if you do not have a huge engineering budget, to tie the ends and you know dbzm today streams data to kafka redis and all of that stuff but there is the other part the applier part that i say you know the not the extraction piece is handled by dbzm but you still have to put, take the data from kafka or wherever you are to your target platform and that part is not easy sometimes because imagine if you want to do some kind of data consistency or transactional consistency like they're like seven or eight engineers have to be like plumbing it together so if you're netflix with unlimited engineering budget is all, all <laughs> or if you're DoorDash where you have unlimited engineering budget and you know maybe you know you don't care about profitability in your division whatever I'm, I don't want to speak for if you are that sort of organization you know I think they should adopt DBZM because you know you can throw eight or ten people in, into building ETL pipelines um, uh, is that the right thing to do business wise in this economic situation I'm not sure but we are getting into situations where one or two engineers have been thrown in the project trying to stitch together things they've been trying for eight nine months uh the perception is that it's going to be easy because uber has done it or netflix has done it or some you know unicorn san francisco company just decided to do it but in reality uh you know uh, companies are not achieving the goal after eight or ten months so there is a lot of complexity in that work and i'm not even going to specific features or how they how each of their connectors are. We can cover that in a separate topic, but I think that DBZM is a unique open source technology that requires a lot of engineering talent to build something that can give value to your, uh, to your uh, users, right? Who are the consumers of data. If you, and that value takes eight to 10, 12 months to, you know, uh, realize. And which is why, you know, people are coming to us and said, hey, you know, we want something off the shelf. So that would be my, you know, uh, answer to the the overall situation. And then we can go into some, you know, uh, depths. Sure. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. I mean, we're, we're coming into this conversation talking specifically about the Vizium, but the way that a lot of people get here is basically like, I've got a database, I've got a production database, I'm doing a lot of transaction processing serving my core application. And, you know, as, um, as Raj said, like I, I don't necessarily want to throw a bunch of analytical load onto this database because that's my production database. So I basically just want to take it and I want to copy over there. That's where a lot of people start. Like I, want, I have this database and I want it in my analytics warehouse over here. Um, maybe I want to, you know, cause, do some operational data flows from like causing things to happen elsewhere in my infrastructure based on things that are happening in my database. but. It starts with just like, I want to sync these two things together. Um, and Divisium, it's like, it's basically like saying, I want a car because I want to take a road trip. So I'm going to start with an engine and then I'm going to figure out the rest. I'm going to build the rest around it, um, which is like for most people, that's probably not what you want. You probably are looking for something a little bit simpler. So, you know, when I, I look at like conversation around CDC, uh, I see a lot of fear, honestly, or it's like, you know, when people talk about CDC or should I adopt CDC, uh, other people will quickly join, jump into threads and be like, hey, you, you probably don't want to get into that, which is a little sad and silly because if you're talking about like, just I've got a database here and I want it synchronized over there, CDC is the way to do it. It is by far the most efficient way of actually moving data from one place into another. So the problem really as, as an industry and sort of from a user experience perspective and trying to set this up is that it's just too damn hard. Uh, it basically, you know, like there, there's a lot to like in terms of technical approach and implementation within Debezium, but like look at their documentation and tell me that that is an approachable way of building something. Um, you know, so as, that's sort of the, the major issue. And, um, you know, we've, we both kind of looked at how we can simplify this from different perspectives. There are also some technical issues with Debezium as well, which, which have come up, which we can get into. Yeah, I'd like like I'm happy, Johnny. Like, uh, yeah. That, what what are some of the technical issues that people are finding, and uh, uh, 
you know, as you know, Raj was saying, like, oh, you start on a journey, maybe a couple months in, oh, there's some scalability thing that you didn't consider and then found, or there's another thing, like, what, what are some of these specifically? And uh, yeah, yeah. So to give just a little backstory here, um, I, I just want to talk for a moment about how CDC actually works and what it means within the database. Um, so databases like offer this really useful primitive of a transaction, which is basically like I can make a change to a bunch of tables and all of those changes are going to sort of commit or like become visible all at once together or not at all if it's rolled back. So it, it gives me this, this way of like changing a bunch of related things at the same time. Um, but databases are like built on top of spinning hard disks or SSDs these days, but they're built on top of disks. Uh, which are anything but transactional. Like a disk, if you're trying to write data to a disk, it will freely just say like, you know, I wrote half of it and then someone pulled the plug from the wall and the other half got lost, sorry. So databases have to offer this sort of transactional primitive on top of a piece of hardware that doesn't offer transactions. So write ahead logs is the technique that databases use in order to offer transactionality. So briefly, a write ahead log is where a database sort of records the set of changes it is, you know, if it's planning to make in an open transaction or it is already made in a transaction that's committed, it's basically journaling the changes that are being made to the database, as well as markers of like whether a transaction is committed. So then if you pull the plug from the wall and the database crashes, what it's able to do on startup is look at that write ahead log and say, okay, this transaction committed, so it's, it's applied. This transaction was rolled back, so I'm going to ignore it, uh, and so on. So this is really something that databases created for themselves in order just to implement the database in the first place, you kind of need this. Um, but it ends up being really useful for watching that database and trying to extract out what's happening inside of that database as some external application. Um, and pretty much all of the, of the databases now have implemented features that take like the sort of the raw binary physical logs that the database is keeping in this right ahead log and, you know, uh, adding logical replication streams on top of it to make it really nice and easy to get out of the database. But <clears throat> the problem is these databases are only keeping write ahead logs around for a limited amount of time. If you've got like a multi terabyte database, a multi terabyte table, even um, the database is going to keep a write ahead log around for really recent changes and not much more than that. After, after, you know, things have, are far enough in the past, it doesn't need the right ahead log around anymore. It would be a lot to keep around on disk. So databases don't do that. And the primary challenge, if you're trying to implement change data capture, is that you rarely care about just the ongoing changes to the table. You actually really want like a full sync of the entire content of the table that is reactive in response to ongoing changes that are happening within that table. So it's not enough to just say like, I want changes that are happening, you know, starting from now and going forward. That's actually quite easy to do. The hard part is saying I want all of this history and then I want it to stitch together exactly with the ongoing changes that are coming from this replication. And that's the hard part. So one of the like major issues when we started looking at this a couple of years ago, um, and, and uh, one of the major issues is that like if you, um, if you want this logically consistent snapshot, the way that uh, Debezium still default today, the way that Debezium does this is it basically takes the transact, it starts a transaction that is locking the database or locking tables within the database. And what that is effectively doing is it's causing the database, it's forcing the database to keep around all of the write ahead logs for ongoing changes of that table. And then while it's got this, this lock, it does this flex star, essentially. It's like scanning out all of the contents of the table. Um, and the issue is that this can take a while. Like if you've got a multi-terabyte database, that flex star, it's going to be running potentially for many days. Um, and while that's happening, this, this your database is basically filling up its disk with write ahead log segments, which is a great recipe for running out of disk space on your operational production database. So one of the core issues that we really wanted to address was how do we do like correct backfills in a incremental way without bringing down your production database while we're doing it uh, and, and keeping the load on that database very low. Uh, so that's, um, 
that's like was one of the primary motivators that started us out on this journey. Uh, others are, you know, for a variety of reasons, like we've heard repeatedly from partners and vendors and uh, customers that um, like the actual snap, you know, the, the data you're getting out is not always logically consistent. And by that, I mean, like you'll get, you know, for some particular key in your table, you'll get like an update that happens before it's inserted. Uh, or you might see two inserts for a particular key, which doesn't really make sense because you can only insert a key, then update it, and then delete it. You can't like you can't insert a key twice. It doesn't make sense uh, unless in, you know, assuming that there's a primary uh, a primary key on the table. So those are two major issues that uh, that we were kind of setting out to address, and uh, that, you know that we really wanted to resolve in the work that we were doing in this space. Um, I'm, Raj, I'm sure you probably have a similar kind of story around this. No, I think a uh, great point. I think we published a blog post last year or this year. I don't even remember. We specifically, you know, mentioned about this because um, the I think one of the um, biggest adopters of DPCM was Shopify. And, uh, you know, we spoke with John uh, Martin, who was the ar architect who implemented and I wrote the blog post in the first place. They have written that they couldn't use DPCM for the largest tables in Shopify MySQL because of this problem, right? And I think um, it's kind of interesting. Um, that's a problem, I think, you know, uh, anyone in the CDC space. And this is the thing, Lauren, Mary, and Johnny, right? I think, you know, you, you can use DPCM to kind of come with a functional prototype of what CDC can do and model, like, you know, it's, it's a way to demonstrate a an attempt to modernize your database infrastructure, it won't be the main, not necessarily be the product you actually use to do that, you know, because if you have a small data set, you can show, you can plug in DBZM and you can may want to log the tables and all of that and show value. But, you know, imagine a production database, like as Johnny said, like, and that's a problem we have also solved in Archeon because you can't go to a DBA and like ask, okay, you know, log the database and all of that. And there is that problem uh, that's, I. They may have changed things recently, but as of last month, I think all their connectors had a bit of that, um, which is why I think some of the founders of DBZM uh, uh, who have now joined other companies, they are um, advocating a lot of this. Oh, you need to have a read replica of your production database from which DBZM can run. And I'm like, okay, dude, nobody's going to give you double the hardware. Just right, you're just doubling everything cuts. at that point, right. <laughs> so they don't solve the real problem. I also feel, Johnny, because they do not do end-to-end -end stuff, and there's no motivation in even trying to do it consistently. Okay, man, like we're going to just jump to Kafka, and then it's somebody else's problem to handle duplicate records or, you know, like, okay, some insert has shown up twice. So because they are not solving another hard problem, which is achieve the transactional consistency on the target side, okay, you can, you can dump whatever to Kafka and then it's somebody else's problem. Well, if yeah. you are having eight smart engineers who understand this thing in Netflix and DoorDash or Uber, you are fine. But imagine you're like a single person doing stuff. I mean, um, you can't, right? So this is because of the nature of what DBZM does, it is like, okay, I'm gonna do the extraction part and the other part of transforming and applying somebody else's problem. Uh, I'm very curious to see how using DBZM, a company is solving that. And I think there are a few companies in the space that have publicly said we are using DBZM for the source part, where I think one of the founders of the DBZM technology has joined. I'm very curious to see because we have seen obvious issues with DBZM, the way it is structured. And I'll come to a very specific thing here, which is my one of my favorite topic in the Kafka land. So if you have a CDC log stream and you want to do even at the table level redo log, which is serial in nature, and you want to have uh, you know the redo log stream for a particular table going to a Kafka topic, which is has partitions, how on earth you are going to stitch together the order of transactions when the data is distributed on Kafka? You can use Kafka's exactly once and all of that, but you're going to slow the pipeline like hell. So. We have customers now where we are streaming data to Kafka in our own format, and I'm finding a similar problem here. Like if your technology is so much dependent on something like Kafka, and honestly, I think DBZM is supporting Redis and other stuff now, but all the all the customer implementations have been on Kafka. So if you're putting data on Kafka, 
and you have one topic and multiple partitions, how are you going to stitch together the data? You can, obviously, you know, you can put markers. Imagine like you have one engineer doing all of that stuff. So I think there's a lot of that because they haven't thought about the problem on the applier side. Like it makes, because they're like, okay, it's somebody else's problem. And, you know, um, which is a good thing because, you know, the likes of Archeon and Estuary and other companies that are solving the problem, they can wear their, you know, technology hats and solve it. I... I have some other challenge. I would like to talk about some other challenges of DBZM. I think uh, a, um, you know, the open source community is great, but at times they overdo their own marketing. And I know we have talked about marketing at the start of this conversation. I have read tweets from founders of DBZM that oh, you know, for the last few years, DBZM has been the CDC standard. My friends, you are not, you are not the CDC standard. If there was ever a CDC standard, there's only one technology in the market today, which is uh, Golden Gate from Oracle. Which from Oracle, right, right. Which, which another, you know, a Stream is is going after uh, STR IIM yeah, yeah. is going after as well. And, and yeah. I agree. Like that's. So you know. I think it's good that you are getting. You know, um, I think they get emotionally. I think charged at times. Uh, and I, I I read it and I'm like, okay, fine. I've spent enough you know, years in the database space, you know, more than close to 20 to know that nothing is a standard right now other than Golden Gate, uh, you know. So I I feel, I look at it and I'm like screaming in my head, like, okay, they need to stop this as well. Uh, um, you you are not, the, you know, DBZM is not a CDC standard. Uh, there's actually no CDC standard, honestly, but, you know, if you talk about standards being like pro products that have been deployed in like, let's say, at least a thousand companies in real time. That would be Golden Gate. I, I don't think there's any other product that has got that kind of production thing, right? Uh, you can create 1,000 toy apps, but you know, like I'm looking at production grade things that are running for like years without downtime and that kind of stuff. So they need to tone down a little bit of that marketing. Uh, and you know, I'm busy with my company's work and I don't get time on Twitter to like call out these things. At times I want to, but you know, we are all, the good thing uh, about open source stuff is if you're working in Red Hat or working in IBM or like some other company and working open source thing, you don't have to care about PNL. You're not going to profitability of your company. So, you know, <laughs> you can do, you can talk about whatever. I think Johnny, I, all of us have a social and economic responsibility to, <laughs> to, to the community to give them, you know. So I think they need to tone that thing a little bit in the greater interest of the data engineering community, because a lot of companies I have talked to who are our customers now have spent a lot of money trying to implement this. And you know what happens? I'll give another angle to it. You know, this is like a non-technical angle. You know, this batch versus CDC, some of the cloud vendors and some of the famous warehouses sort of technology, like they actually like batch. Why? Mm -hmm. Because every day, you truncate the table and you do this auto refresh from all your CSVs and parquets. And you know what? The compute bill is going higher and higher because, you know, even if 1% of the data changes, you're loading all the 3 billion rows from the parquet files every day. Who is getting money? Um, you know, um, Amazon is obviously getting all the compute horsepower there. And obviously, uh, the data is going to another extremely good partner of theirs. So they're kind of, you know, but who is the, you know, the, the, the poor... Uh, data engineering budget is going higher and higher because of you know this uh, batch. So there is, I I have felt in recent times that there is that cloud, uh, e you know, ecosystem that also doesn't want CDC to be you know um, uh, that efficient because it also you know will decrease their compute you know bills and all of that. So there is that angle where I I've seen that uh, and you know. Um, Google could be an exception to this because I think they are trying to play the engineers game here. Like, you know what, let's let's do something that's good for engineers rather than milking like the thing. Uh, there is that aspect. I think some of the cloud vendors and some of the warehouses, they just love this batch thing because it gives just more money yeah. because it processing the same data again. And the other angle on DBZM is just on the connectors part. I think um, some of the connectors are good. But um, like our focus is mostly on the enterprise stuff. We don't do that much work on MySQL. We, we do it, but you know our focus has been on Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, and that kind of side stuff. So um, 
Raj, I think we're going to have to make you a co-host because you're very much in the tech bro spirit of uh, calling out some of the, the the marketing hype. And it, you said it very well for the for the greater good of the uh, the community, whatever that means. But I think you're saying it in in, in, in the the spirit that we want it to be said. Um, Johnny, I saw you mostly nodding along there with what Raj. Yeah, said. yeah, I I do think that, like a lot of the the pitfalls really stem from you know. Debezium, you cannot say Debezium without also saying Kafka and Confluent and Kafka Connect in the exact same breath. And I think a lot of the, the challenges are that these are, they're not necessarily holistically fitting together. Um, like I, I, before the show, I went and I was just looking at some docs and I have a couple of choice quotes in their own words. Like, so from the Debezium documentation, uh, consuming applications can expect to see every event exactly one time. However, when things go wrong, it is always possible to see an event at least once. Okay, so it's exactly one time except for when it's not. Um, then in the <laughs> Kafka Connect documentation for Postgres, I was like shocked to find that the Postgres connector is at least once. So this is for syncing data into Postgres. So you're taking a transactional database doing change data capture, and then getting at least once delivery into another transactional database. Um, my favorite is actually from Snowflake. So Snowflake took the time and effort to build their own uh, Kafka uh, sync connector for pulling from Kafka. Uh, and uh, they quote, uh, use data loaded chain, uh, chaining that eliminates duplicate copies of repeating data except in rare circumstances, period. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How rare. <laughs> You know that those are that that fills me with um, I, I don't know like yeah that that's definitely going to help me sleep well at night. So yeah. I, like there, there's there's basically like a there's a, kind of an ethos and an attitude of like yeah it mostly works and it's great except it when it's not but don't worry about that. <laughs> right. Um, right. I'd like to mention like you know this is the problem right I think this is exactly why you know um, a CTO or like a head of analytics and you know uh, engineering or whatever. This is the fear because there's so much noise about a uh, about technologies that do not work. People come to us, oh, you know, CDC. I think it's cool, but you know, uh, will it ever work in, for us? Because it doesn't seem like working anywhere. So this is a problem. I think it's sad, um, silly, and sad, as Johnny said. Like you know, we are facing the problem that you know, because of uh, technologies that do not work, hundred percent. And imagine like buying a database where uh, you know what, like. You know, for five minutes a day, your data can be inconsistent. Like, okay, it's the same problem. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, I think we're having a challenge. Honestly, um, people think it's it, they should go there, but they are very fearful uh, of getting it right because of this problem. We find that too. So, I mean, estuary, like we are fundamentally we're a streaming platform. We don't really talk about it that way because streaming is not in vogue these days. Like. You know, from my, the way I would tell the story is that everyone got real excited about Kafka and implementing like streaming backbones within their organizations like 10, 12 years ago. So many people got burned that, you know, from trying to do this and just falling flat on their faces, honestly, and building it within their organizations. Like it really kicked off, in my opinion, the rise of what's now called the modern data stack, which is essentially saying like, this is too hard. Let's just throw it all into the warehouse, like snowflakes here. Let's just do it there. Um, because that is just so much easier for us to reason about and think about and implement. Um, and honestly, I think it's set like streaming as a term of art within within engineering. It set it back like years, just based on the the poor experience that people had uh, in trying to, to build these kinds of applications uh, in house. And then, like you still see this today when people talk about CDC, because again, it's in the same breath as streaming, and that frightens people away pretty much immediately. But what I always find really ironic about this is that they'll then turn to a technology like Fivetran and Snowflake, and they're streaming there too. Like when when the way that companies actually use these batch tools is for incremental delivery of new data into a warehouse or wherever it is that they're transforming it, and then they bend over backwards, building the, you know optimized CBT pipelines that are trying to do incremental compute on some kind of roll up or whatever it is that they want. It's all streaming at the end of the day. It's still streaming if you are running at an hourly cadence or a five minute cadence or, you know, on continuously. Uh, so it's all variations on a theme, which I, I find a little bit silly uh, within the industry. Yeah. But, 
Everyone, see, the problem with this is, like you said, it is, you know, you're just spreading out a pipeline at that point, and everyone along the pipeline, you know, is taking, you know, the cut and giving their version of the world. Uh, I don't know. The whole thing is funny. But, but like, that, that brings to another point here, right? Like, like you know, with things like DBT uh, and doing all your transforms, you know, after data's landed and, and your, your Snowflake or your BigQuery or, or your whatever – um, and then things like Airflow as well, which uh, is it supports the same like SQL first often, uh, you know, uh, SQL, 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 and stacking and layering SQL. Um, like, I mean, I, I've always been pretty vocal about how like you know it's okay if you're you know a small company and it suits your needs, right? Like what Rod said earlier um, about like you know what kind of house do you need to buy? Uh, and maybe that's the right house for you at a certain company, but um, like, what, what are the patterns that Airflow, DBT, um, you know, this whole ELT thing? Um, mm-hmm. what, what's what are, what's what's going wrong there? In in your opinion? Yeah, and then I, I'll, I'll, yeah go ahead. It, it's silly. Like ETL versus ELT is a dumb debate. The answer is ETLT. <laughs> Like, and, which is what people have been doing forever and will always do and continue to do. Uh, honestly, I, I feel often like ELT and ETL is like some made up fictional debate that companies are having just in order to like duke it out in their marketing and, and make their offering appear differentiated. Um, this, the answer is like, it, you, of course you have to transform along the way. Like Fivetran, when it's pulling data out of Salesforce, that's not exactly how the data came from Salesforce. There's a ton of transformation that it's doing before it's landing it into your warehouse, whether you want it to or not. Uh, so there's transformation happening there. You ought to, as a user, have more control over how that transformation works. And there's transformation you want to do after it's landed in the warehouse. I'm not like disparaging DBT entirely. It's great for a lot of use cases that people use it for. But to, to say like, we only do ELT is just dumb, in my opinion. Like, you, you have to transform on the way to it. it. It really is so dependent on the use case. Yeah, I think ET, yeah. So I I have a bit of, like, concern on, you know, the overall thing where I think we are falling into this hype cycle where it has to be A or B, and there can't be like anything in between. Like, you know, it's like, okay, we're all like ELT now. Like everything has to be driven computationally by the target data warehouse or wherever we're lining the data. That's my fundamental problem. Like, okay, why are we, um, you know, why should we choose between, you know, okay, if I want to be modern, I have to go to ELT. No, you do not. Like as Johnny mentioned, there has to be like a small T, uh, between ENL and probably a large T at the end. Now, my other challenge has been, you know, on this and, you know, on the compute side of this, where, you know, this new world where I have to pay, continuously keep paying for what I'm using, which is a good thing. But in order for a large enterprise to be, um, doing this in an economically like all the engineers have to be super efficient if i'm just go back like 20 years back like teradata and oracle exadata you bought an oracle box or a teradata box and like a large warehouse exadata warehouse or a teradata warehouse or even the likes of vertica for example right when people were doing analytics on top of this like you wouldn't think twice before trying out a few bad queries you know experimental queries okay let me see if CTs are going to work or, you know, a view is going to work or what is going to work because you're not paying continuously paying for that compute, right? You bought right. the compute once a time and you, I'm free to experiment on my data. This new and, it's, and, and it's CapEx usually at that point, yes. right? It's coming out of a CapEx budget. It's wow. not the problem is there's a cost to experiment. There is a cost. Right. There is a big cost if you ran like a bad query. Mm-hmm. And that is my fundamental problem right now. Are we actually being more innovative or are we actually stopping innovation right now with this new model? And I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, um, so I am very fearful of trying new things on my data warehouse clusters that I'm running because I don't want my CEO to call me in the middle of the night. Oh, you know what? Your $1,000 warehouse became like 3000 So 
um is it efficient to do that large t at the end even on a warehouse is is a huge debate right now and uh, i think we could go to go into specific technologies like dbt and others how they do it which i'm i think as a technologist i i have a challenge with how they it's a great framework and a great tool to uh do your transforms but how do you execute the transforms i have i have you know i think there is a bit of uh, a uh, technology leap they have to take there uh, because uh, you can't use those time stamps and all of that uh, in the target system for you know refreshing your models it is only going to increase your uh, cloud data warehousing bills and of course of course aws would love it gcp would love it as much as you know some of my partners but you know it's not going to sustain honestly i think i it, spending money without thinking through things just requires a a new product that is better you know um that's that's how it has been we have seen the hadoop world where we were all led to think that that's the solution to all the all the big data analytics and then very quickly people figured out okay you know that's not it i think um i'm very curious to see who is going to solve the good compute part of the transformation thing because you look at dbt it's not a compute engine right they just throw in everything at the target and then you know if you have a problem with how you trigger that like if you like the way dbt does its incremental thing and i think they are good partners of ours i've communicated that to them that you know they have you can't have a select query run on a one petabyte table to find out two rows have changed and you have to refresh the model right, right. you know it's going to yep. at, at some scale it's not going to work out uh either you will be thrown out of the pipeline or somebody is going to not have that table in the target system if that's the use case so i think that uh doing transformations inside a data warehouse in the cloud where you are continuously paying for the select queries or whatever it's a very different model than let's say if you're running dbt on oracle and teradata i'm just giving an example right your oracle bill is not going up because you paid for it once the 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 the, you know, the capex thing your teradata bill is not going to go up right mm-hmm. your snowflake bill is going to go up if you're putting more models so right. so how does it work now you know is it going to be and i think there has to be a solution very soon i don't know the likes of coalesce or the what what does the new products do i think coalesce i'll take it to a look at it uh, because i know one of the investors like i mean they are like also like a okay i'm going to put a Doing all the transform compute on the data warehouse is not going to work in the future. I'm, I think I'm, I, I believe that there has to be a solution somewhere else. Yeah, I'd actually even like to broaden the conversation a little bit because we've been talking a lot about SQL and warehouses, but I think this is really a broader conversation where SQL is a great way to do transformation, but there are others, and warehouses are a great place to work with data, but there are other places as well. So things like vector DBs, which are very hot right now, we just built our first connector for Pinecone, uh, and then also uh, like Elasticsearch tools like that, tools that are not SQL warehouses, but they're very much systems where you want to work with data. Like in order to do change data capture and flow data, so one use case we see a lot is like I have a database, I want to enable search over that database, I basically want to plug it into Elastic. Well, you can't take a raw table and directly just plop it into Elastic. There's got to be some kind of transformation that's happening along the way in order to make that data useful and elastic. So that's an example where you need transformation in the middle. Um, and then transformation, like SQL is wonderful, but it's not the only way of doing transformation. And in some respects, like the, the vision, like, like the thing I want to bring us back to is actually like 1978 and more of the Unix philosophy of like pipelines programs. Uh, Martin Kleppman wrote a great piece on this a few years back uh, where it's Basically, like the the thing that we're, in my opinion, really kind of missing is an ability to just write programs that sit in the middle of a Unix pipe and have data fed into them and write outputs that go somewhere else and uh, get to just pretend that they're running forever, uh, that they don't have to worry about being in a distributed system. They don't have to worry about application crashes. They just get to sort of, you know, imagine like writing a Python program that's just dealing with inputs line by line. And we've... Like it's a very, it's like, that's the model that we use if we're just like running a, a test batch query, you know, we're playing with the data set 
why can't we take that model and run it as a production grade data pipeline as well? Like it, it's basically the, the focus on SQL is a little myopic in my opinion. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, well, and, and I think like, I mean, it's, it's the easiest to, well, maybe that's an absolute statement, but it, it's, it's easy to learn uh, relative to, um, you know, if you're starting from zero or, or near zero, it's the easiest thing to learn. And so people get kind of addicted to it. Uh, is it's, 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 I don't know, distribution yeah. market is, is what it is. That's changing. That's something we've been playing with. It's actually quite fun. I've, I've been having fun playing with it. It's like open AI. You know, this is a great example where like, if you want to run something through chat GPT and build like a continuous AI pipeline, there's no way to do that in SQL today, really. Like, if you want to call out to OpenAI and get a ChatGPT completion, how do you do that? Uh, so that's a, a particular example of like a kind of transformation in the middle we're working on that uh, you know uh, we want to enable, and I'm, I'm, I suspect other people would want to use as well. Yeah. Explain that more. Explain that more. What what you're describing? Yeah, yeah. So here's an here's an example use case. Uh, I'm literally working up right now. We should have a blog post out on it next week. Um, you have uh, a bunch of data within your own Slack, and I apologize because we're drifting way off topic to be the end. We'll just finish this thought. You have uh, a bunch of data sitting in Slack. Uh, part of what our our uh, tool allows for is basically just capturing all of that data that's in your Slack instance. Uh, and then transforming it as, as it's happening. So as conversations are evolving within Slack. Um, so being able to take that, roll that up, turn it into a, a context that you can actually hand to ChatGPT and ask it to do something, and then run that as a transformation while the data is in motion. So basically like in response to someone typing a response in a Slack thread, taking that, rolling it up, handing it to ChatGPT, and then asking it, you know, please summarize this thread for me in one sentence. As, mm -hmm. as an example task. Uh, and then taking that as an output, the data product output that represents sort of a transformation of this thread and then doing something with it, maybe you know, putting it in a spreadsheet just so people can see kind of what the ongoing conversations are. It's just a, a toy example, but that like there's all kinds of uh, interesting kinds of transformation that can be brought to bear that are rather hard to express using just SQL. Wow. Yeah. We have a question. We have a question here from Fred, who asks, "Would you drive your data into main memory for the design, development, and delivery of digital services?" Um, drive it into main memory. Um, well, maybe that's more of a rhetorical question he's asking, mm -hmm. or like I don't know. Uh, Fred, yeah. feel free to uh, expand on that if you want. Uh, no worries. Yeah. We, uh, I mean, certainly for delivery of any kind of data intensive application, especially if you have low latency requirements, memory is involved, like caching is involved. You, you can't go to disk every time or caching some particular record. Um, Maybe like a, a slightly more targeted question, we'd be able to answer a bit better. But, um, you know, m most things in the engineering world are all about like caching and layers, you know, layers of indirection. And, and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, caching people a lot of times, uh, you know, don't think of like a lot of it is figuring out where the cache is going to be uh, with any of this stuff. Another user, LinkedIn, sorry, I can't see who wrote this, but uh, it says LinkedIn user. LinkedIn user asks, uh, what's your opinion about tools like Benthos? Yeah, um, and I'm not an expert on it. I've looked at it a little bit and I, I think I can speak cogently about it. Um, if it works for you, you know, generally that's the tool that you're going to run on a single box. You know, you, um, it's generally going to be useful for smaller data scales, and it's also very much like a an engineer in an IDE writing config, writing you know, writing stuff that's going to control the application and the overall data pipeline. It's it's a tool that you're bringing to bear to move data around, and if that works for you, great. Um, there's a uh, a pretty wide like space of you know gamut of users who might want to use data in some capacity and I'm, I, I realize I'm being extremely broad here but data is like it's like water it touches everything in modern organizations um, so you know that's not going to necessarily be appropriate for all users like um, but uh, if it works for you go for it 
Did you want to jump in on that one, Raj, on Benthos? I think that, that question was from Amandeep, by the way. Yeah, we haven't, I haven't encountered like, you know, um, like, like where, you know, evaluating like us against them. I think that's also like, you know, um, another example in uh, in my mind would be Airbyte, like probably like, you know, which I, I don't know how many production connectors they have right now, but I get into discussions where, you know, my database is 10 gigs or five gigs and, you know, have like some of these and I really don't want to pay for anything. It's kind of like want something simple uh, with like, you know, reasonable UI or whatever. So, um, I think, as Johnny said, if it works for you, if you don't have the complexity of that, like, you know, the pipeline complexity that we're talking about and your users, your end users who are the consumers of the data are okay with a few, you know, things missed here and there, I think it's good. Uh, and those are, I think Mentos is easier to start, I think, <laughs> projects. Uh, um, but uh, beyond that, I haven't encountered them on like some of, some of the complex um, uh, stuff yet. I think it's and, and that that's true even for the likes of Five Ten. You know, I think they have done a terrific job of getting into the a lot of small data sets, streaming. You know, kind of incrementally going to the to the cloud. And obviously, they did the Azure acquisition. You know, a few years back. So hoping to see a lot of the CDC stuff also coming out from that. But I think uh, that problem is challenging in itself. Taking a lot of like you know data from Salesforce, HubSpot, mapping them, transforming them on the way. Uh, you know, that's another aspect of data integration that is challenging as well. But I think, you know, um, we do not see a lot of like this, uh, you know, Benthos or that kind of stuff with the database use cases, honestly. Yeah, it feels, uh, and, you know, this may be unfair and I apologize, but it feels a little bit like a great tool for a team of one. Um, and I, I'm not sure how that really scales to a larger work organization, even a moderately larger organization with different stakeholders at different levels of technical ability. What, um, yeah, what, what, uh, so, you know, both of you are, uh, you know, uh, co-founded your organizations, um, you know, uh, Raj, you're coming from more of the enterprise, like you've worked with the largest of the large before Johnny, you know, you've, you've, uh, done a startup before exited it. Uh, so I love that we have, you know, two people who, uh, uh, you know, have, 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 you know, different experiences um, in what they've done in their careers. Um, what, what, what are the plans? And, and I'll ask you both this individually, but what are your plans for uh, your companies in the next 12 months? Like, Johnny, what does Estuary have on the horizon for, uh, uh, you know, broad roadmap or, or go to market or, or anything else you want to share? Yeah. Just a quick like two sentence on what we do, which I probably should have led with earlier. It's basically just capturing data. You know, it's a, it's a tool that allows you to capture data, generally just using UI from a wide variety of sources, including technical systems for C using CDC and also SaaS APIs and, you know, push webhooks to us, whatever. So capture data from all kinds of places, uh, landed into collections, which are basically real time data lakes. So these are, uh, you know, using files in your files of JSON in your cloud storage that are also millisecond latency data streams. Um, and then transform them, build new collections of data through transformation in uh, various different ways. And then finally, materializing back out again. So taking a, a, a collection of data, materializing that into some system, which could be a warehouse like Snowflake or BigQuery. It could also be Elasticsearch or a OLTP database even a key value store or like a SaaS API. So all, all kinds of places where you want to push data back out again. Um, and then just doing this in an online, always on capacity. Uh, so basically these pipelines are running continuously as quickly as they can all the time. Um, so where we're taking it from here, it's integrations are of course deeply important. So just connecting to various sources and destinations of data. Um, We've focused a lot so far on warehouses and just getting stuff into databases because that's where a lot of the industry is and what they want to use. But there are a lot of interesting places to go from here. Uh, one that we're exploring is vector databases, basically just being able to take data, vectorize it, maintain it within an index that can be used for various AI applications. Um, and then we're also getting into enabling other and new kinds of transformation. So as I said earlier, just being able to write a Python program that and keep around, you know, keep stuff in memory, keep around state on disk, whatever, 
and is able to transform data kind of as it's in motion, just read from standard in, write to standard out. Um, so being able to offer new kinds of uh, transformation capability that kind of meet users where they are, like write a Python script, write a Ruby, whatever it is you write, uh, just bring it and be able to run it as a transformation. Cool. So from our side, we are not, uh, we, our focus is more on the ENL part of it and like, you know, the, the enterprise connectivity. So our roadmap would be, you know, like um, maybe starting to, you know, support like all sort of type of mainframes. Uh, we're trying to do some more on the uh, connector side, uh, better versions of our SQL Server and other connectors. And there is one push that we're doing, which is uh, trying to add um, that, you know, value add on top of CDC. A um, couple of things we are planning to do this year. Um, so if you have a, let's say, MongoDB kind of stuff and you want do not want to dump as JSONs into your target system, but you're kind of like, want to learn if there is a normalized relational data that's hidden inside the Mongo stream, like uh, try to do that kind of transformations along the schema side and the data side. So that's like a big, big thing that we are doing right now, uh, taking kind of semi-structured data and converting to relational. And the other biggest, I think the biggest initiative right now in the company is to um, extend CDC to files. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Parquet, Parquet being uh, uh, like a standard right now, like we have seen a lot of use cases where people are just, the source of data is Parquet because you don't get access to the database. So the data engineering team just has Parquet dumped by some other tool. Uh, we're working on like a brand new stuff where we can detect like uh, changes across Parquet files that existed yesterday and then a new refresh that comes today. So instead of truncating the table on the target side and loading all the parquets. Can you figure out from yesterday and today how many rows have changed? So think of like, instead of a source as a database, like think of source as parquet. So that's our biggest initiative right now. I think we have more than a dozen, you know, <laughs> users waiting for that feature where, uh, hey, you know, think of our database is parquet on S3. So that's like our biggest initiative on the roadmap side, other than, you know, I mean, we're going to do some announcements with our, some new partners very soon, uh, you know, uh, as an integration company, we got to do that. And other thing that we are trying to do um, a lot, which I think Johnny mentioned previously is the redo logs on the source database side, they go away after X hours and you can't ask the DBA to keep them around for like five days, 10 days. So we are trying to figure out and Golden Gate has this concept of trail files that they keep on disk. So we're trying to see uh how to extend that in a very highly compressed format on s3 and gcs and that kind of stuff so you know the ability to uh, store redo log streams in a very efficient format so that you can act on it later is something that we're looking at right now as a roadmap item excellent cool well i, I feel well, like we got maybe 10 percent into what um we would have liked to have you guys talk about so we'll just have to have you back right <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, this was incredible. Um, obviously, yeah, for some folks, like very much in in the weeds, but cutting through the the, the marketing hype that we see on most of these discussions. And what's astonishing to me is like that we can be, you know, talking about the pros and cons of DB, DBZM and then in the same, very same context, talking about what now can be done with chat GPT. Like the spectrum here is just like incredible. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Lauren, did you want to have a last question for the guests or maybe a, a last word from you? Um, I know you've got a, a couple thoughts on all this, one or two. No, no, no. <laughs> Thanks for joining us both. And uh, yeah, where uh, where can people find you and where yeah. can people, uh, you know, say hi or, or learn more about your companies? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go first. So uh, we're Estuary, so E-S-T-U-A-R-Y, the traditional spelling of Estuary, dot dev, T-E-V. Uh, is our site. We've got a, um, a public Slack uh, come um, come hang out. We're also fully source available on GitHub, so you can check us out there as well um, under you know the same org name, Estuary, under GitHub. So we are Archeon, um, Archeon.io. Um, uh, we, we are not open source yet, but we just open source our docs, uh, you know, as of um, this week. 
so you, you know um, all our users can kind of you know chime in and figure out what's wrong with the docs so uh, we do have open trials in our cloud product um, uh, our saas offering uh, we support like mostly all the major sources and targets so if you're interested come to archeon.io sign up for the cloud it's a 2 minute you know thing and then you can get started so you know happy to you know um, and then we have like all of all the other means of engaging contact sales and others which i think engineers are not very fond of these days so awesome so people know where to find you will and we'll we'll have you back yeah go ahead johnny no i was just, i was laughing at uh, how little engineers want to be marketed to uh, yeah it, the, the moment an engineer smells anything that might be marketing they just run away <laughs> the the sign of a true engineer right yeah Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Uh thanks everyone. We'll see you next time and hopefully Johnny and Raj we expect you to be regular viewers now. All right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Cool. Thanks both. Take care everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.